Hello, everybody. To those of you who haven't met me before, my name is Deborah Oppenheimer. Um, I'm one of the partners here at Altitude Community Law, and we're going to talk about owner to owner disputes and when an association has to get involved um, and when you absolutely shouldn't get involved. So uh, let's jump right in, shall we? If I can make my computer work. I always loved testing out the system. Okay, so for many of you who've watched our programs before, you're probably familiar with all this, um, but I always encourage everybody to take a look at the additional resources we have. Um, it's amazing. I've been doing this for 20 years, and so very often um, we have the same things come up again and again. Um, and it might be new to your community, but it's not new under the sun. And, and there's an article or a resource, or there might be a blog, there might be an entire class that you can find that we already have on our resources page on our website. Um, so I always encourage you, um, I know you guys are always counting pennies trying to help your communities do the best they can and not have to expend money for legal services. So I really do encourage you to take a look at our website. We do try and keep it up to date. We try and keep all the information out there um, so that if you need help, um, sometimes you can just find that help without having to reach out and spend spend money on attorney's fees. So take a look at this, because this is, I think, what many homeowners and many board members expect out of each of you as a community manager, someone who can answer every question posed, available 24-7, fixing water leaks, fires, screaming homeowners, fireworks, threats. You must spot every covenant violation because that's your job, right? All of this is something that is expected of all of you managers um, and, and let's be realistic, we're all human. We're gonna miss some violations. We're gonna see some violations um, that maybe others didn't see. Um, we're not always gonna have that answer. And a lot of times I think managers don't give themselves enough um, credit about all the information you do know um, and being willing to say, you know, that's one I just don't know or that's just not mine. Um, and I think you really need to be able to step up and tell either homeowners or the board members um, or anyone else who ask, things aren't always yours to deal with. Um, and I think we're seeing more and more demands made of your time. Um, and some of these things just aren't yours. So what kind of violations are we really talking about when it's owner to owner? Um, and really they're, they're everything under the sun because you know obviously noise is a huge owner to owner issue. And it's certainly something that uh, as managers, uh, you kind of cringe a little when you get that call because it's not like you're on site. Um, the bulk of the managers that you know work with HOAs are gonna be portfolio managers. They're gonna be offsite um, and they're gonna get this call and someone expects them to fix it immediately, but they're not there to even verify it's happening. Um, other violations that we have a lot of that are owner to owner are smells, right? Is it cigarette smoke? Is it marijuana smoke? Um, is it cooking smells? You know, is it um, somebody who really hasn't bathed regularly and you can smell when you walk down the hallway which apartment is, is that person's? Um, is it paint? Somebody's painting and you love that, you know, lovely smell of, you know, strong paint, um, new carpet maybe. Obviously, hoarding brings its own issues because it brings in smells um, of whatever's being collected. And oftentimes, even when what they're collecting isn't dirty because it's piled so high, if there's any humidity at any point during the time they're collecting this, you might start getting mold, right? And that carries its own. Um, another issue we have raised often from owner to owner is chemicals, right? The outdoor chemicals that are being sprayed on the grass. We're seeing that be raised by many homeowners who feel that uh, there's a duty to make sure they don't have to deal with those as well. Um, how about nuisance violations, right? We get these two, right? You get the neighbor complaining that there are neighbors trashy and that he's not picking up his property or he leaves his trash cans out or he doesn't pick up after his dog, he doesn't keep his dogs on leash. Um, as you can see from the violation list, I mean, these issues that we deal with owner to owner um, are really a huge issue. Um, and it's like one of those things where we have to take a step back of how much is really part of the covenant. Uh, one of the things that, 
you know, often gets lost in the analysis is the fact that covenants run and pertain to the land. Well, you know, when I'm talking odors and I'm talking trash, that's really not about the land. That's about the neighbor next door who really isn't taking care of his property, doesn't care how he's affecting his neighbors. That's not really pertaining to the land, um, but we're getting that dumped you know, back on us as one of those issues that we are expected to somehow fix as well. Um, and so that becomes something that we kind of have to look at. Um, pool violations can be an owner to owner as well, depending on what's happening. And then what other kinds of things are we talking about that also frequently comes up as an owner to owner? And that's threat, right? And I think all of us in this industry have seen more and more nasty comments and threats um, than we have. I've been doing this for 20 years and I've seen more nastiness um, owner to owner, um, owner to board, owner to managers um, in the last few years than I have in years. Um, often we get uh, calls as managers, as, as attorneys for the association about perceived or believed to be happening crimes that are occurring. Um, or a panic because you think um, somebody's told you or you found something on the internet that, that you're going to have a criminal move in next to you. Um, those are situations that are often reached out um, to the to the manager that somehow they have to to take that on and deal with that. Um, and then what if there's just lots and lots of police call outs, right? You know, does that become something that becomes yours as well? So those are the kinds of things we're going to try and work through and kind of start with the analysis. So first and foremost, I, I, I want to start, start with many, many, many items are not yours, right? If there is ever a discussion of blood, there's a discussion of weapons, there's a discussion of injuries, somebody's threatening somebody, there's damage that, you know, is, is being threatened, somebody's going to, you know, tear down your building, somebody's going to drive into the building, there's, there's threatened, there's a fire. Those aren't yours, right? Just stop right there. That, you know, that is not your job. That is a police job. You know, if, if there is ever any of these urgent emergencies, this is not yours, okay? Not like I, anybody expects a manager to go step up to somebody with a weapon. You see a weapon, your board hears about a weapon, you call the police. You, you don't let them refer it to you. You don't let them refer it to your counsel. You call the police. This is not something, um, if you've got a meeting, you got somebody who stands up and, and, and says, he's going out to his car to get a weapon. Um, when he walks out the door, lock the door behind him, right? This is not your job to let somebody try and put you in harm's way, okay? So if you've got that going on, just, just know that that's immediately not yours. Call the experts. Call an ambulance for somebody who's injured, call the police, um, but that's not yours to handle and, and never is it should be yours to handle. Um, do know that in fact, if in fact you have that injury, right? Um, just because you can call 911, I'm not telling you don't help somebody if you have the ability to give some aid, right? If you have that ability, if you want to have that, if you want to step in and try and offer uh, something, um, there is a good Samaritan law out there that protects people for stepping in and trying to help someone who's injured, right? Um, so I'm not telling you don't do anything if, if you have that ability to do it, but I'm telling you it's not your job. You can still step in and help just like you could in any circumstance. I'm just telling you that when you are threatened, the association's threatened, it's not your job to be their protector. Um, what I have a question, what about homeless people camping out um, in common areas? Um, well, again, that's going to depend on um, kind of where they're at. So your common areas are owned by the association. So if somebody starts to put up a tent, that's trespassing, right? So just like if somebody, you know, put up a tent in your front yard, you can call the police. That's trespass. It, they don't live there. They don't have a right to be there. Now, if it's a homeowner, and you might all go, Deb, what are you talking about? I actually had that this year, if you have a homeowner who decides to put a camp on the common area because he's trying to make a protest of something the board's doing, then you're going to have to deal with it as uh, a look at your covenants, right? Because your covenants are probably going to say what can be done in the common area, right? 
and probably say that people can't block it, can't alter it. Um, so we're going to have to look to the covenant violation if it's an owner taking that action. But if it's somebody who doesn't live in your community and doesn't have um, any connection to you, then that is something that you're going to um, definitely call the police. But if it's an owner, then we're going to look into the covenants to see how we can help that. Okay. So one of the things that also is going to cause a little bit of a monkey wrench in some of the things that we would normally do and that we have had um, is Fair Housing Act complication. Okay. In October of 2016, uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development decided that HOAs have a duty to step in when owner to owner disputes rise to a level that it is discrimination, right? So that means one neighbor is calling another neighbor names, which would rise to the level of discrimination, right? Um, you call them something that is a slander based upon their race, upon their color, their sex, national origin, or some other protected status under the Fair Housing Act. In the past, you know, we had one neighbor yelling at another neighbor and saying, you know, you're a bleepity bleepity bleep. And I, and I would tell my managers, not your job to make the neighbor nice to their other neighbor. Unfortunately, because the uh, Fair Housing Act uh, and the Department of, of Housing and Urban Development decided to step into it, it is now your job. So in this one circumstance where the name calling rises to a level that it would be discrimination, in that circumstance, you know how you now have a job to take whatever actions you can take, right? Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that if your covenants um, are silent, and that's not uncommon because, you know, covenants, again, are about what concerns the land. So you're not going to have a lot of covenants or rules about calling each other names. What I'm going to re recommend to all your managers is neighbor A is calling neighbor B names. Write a letter to neighbor A. This conduct is not acceptable. It will not be tolerated in our community. It's a complete bluff, folks. We got nothing to hang our hat on because we just looked at our covenants and it's blank, right? But we're going to take our best stab at telling him to stop this behavior. It's almost going to sound like a letter from mom. You shouldn't do that. Stop. That's bad, right? That's your letter. Um, you're going to send a letter to B, the person who got called the names, going, we really don't have any covenants to help you with this. We recommend you contact the police and uh, report this as a hate crime. Because you want to let them both know that there's the person who's being called names, I can't help much. I'm going to try. I'm going to send him a letter, but I really can't help much. And you're going to send a letter to the guy who's calling names, stop this, it's bad behavior. If it is in your covenants, if, if, if what they're doing somehow rises to the level of a covenant violation, of course you're going to enforce your covenants to try and stop it. But most times when it's this discrimination, it's nastiness, there's not much you can do, right? Um, another fair housing complication that we're going to see and that we do see in owner to owner is um, neighbor A's dog bites neighbor B, right? Um, and so you send the letter to neighbor A, violent dogs aren't allowed in the community, get rid of your dog. And all of a sudden that dog is now a service animal. Um, I don't care. Because even if it was a service animal, the statutes are very clear under the FHA that you are not required to allow them to keep a violent animal, even if it's a service animal. So they tell you it's a service animal, we don't care. Go ahead and send the same demand letter back. Even if it's a service animal, it bit somebody, you gotta get rid of the dog because that's not allowed and you're not required to allow a dog um, to stay if in fact it uh, bit somebody. So um, those kinds of things um, kind of give you, there's a little bit of tweak there that you have to deal with, um, but it's one of those things that, that we're going to talk about. Um, question, if there is a condo owner that's continually making construction noise during the day, but the governing documents do not have quiet hours, then does that turn into an owner issue? Well, again, what, what you're looking at is it's a noise complaint, right? And so you're going to look to your covenants. And if there's nothing in your covenants to talk about noise complaints, 
um, then you're going to respond back to the homeowner who is complaining to you. Um, Hi, there's nothing in the covenants. I can't do anything because my job is only to enforce the covenants. Um, okay, so what do you do on a general, and, and this is kind of goes to any complaint that walks in the door. And they, they say, you know, just like this one, the noise is bugging me. So step one on any complaint, I don't, it doesn't matter who it comes from, whether it comes from a board member or a neighbor or anybody, is do I have any authority, right? If it's not in the declaration, you don't have authority. If there's no covenant that talks about noise level, you don't have any authority to go knock on the neighbor's door and tell them to get quiet. You have to start every evaluation of every complaint that walks in your door with, is there a rule against that conduct? Is there a declaration covenant that prohibits that conduct? And if there's not, then your next question is, maybe I can refer them to the state. Maybe I can refer them to the city police, the, the county, right? It's If you don't have authority, you don't have authority. You don't get to, I mean, most homeowners assume, as I started off with, that you have authority to fix everything, and you just don't. The reality is that, you know, your covenants were designed to make sure that your community looked nice, that it kept its value. Um, you know, the whole point of covenants are things that touch and concern the land. It's nearly not about noise and actions of the neighbors and is somebody rude and is somebody not rude? You know, is the neighbor doing things that, that bugs you? I mean, there are a lot of communities that don't have any rules anywhere in their documents about dogs. I've had covenants that I've worked with communities that actually said any dog issue, take it to the county. It, I mean, they just specifically called it out, not our problem in the declaration. Um, and so, but people just assume that the covenants cover everything and that they can just call the manager and you're going to fix everything. And that's just not how it works. Um, again, you really want to look at something and say, um, this is not my to deal with because it's not in the covenants. I only enforce the covenants and the rules. Okay. Um, one of the question is, how do you know if it's discriminatory? Again, you're not looking to, for the most part, prove it, but it's discrimination if, in fact, um, you call somebody a name because of the color of their skin. You know, it's the same as any other time a complaint comes into you. A complaint comes from your neighbor, and their neighbor says, you know, A called me names, and he called me the names because of my color of my skin. That's discrimination. Um, and, you know, and that's all you're going to look at. Um, question, does it include verbal attacks towards a registered sex offender? Okay, so a registered sex offender is not a protected class, right? It, there's nothing, um, discrimination under the Fair Housing Act is only to things that are protected classes, right? A sex offender isn't a protected class. So if neighbor A knows that neighbor B is a registered sex offender and he calls him names, uh, um, that's not discrimination, okay? Can we require SAs and ESAs to be on a leash? Um, yes, you can, so long as the person who is disabled, the disability doesn't affect their hand. Can they hold the leash? If they can hold the leash, you can require them to keep it on leash. Okay. If an owner brings a so-called service animal into the animal restricted pool area in violation of pool rules, can that be mitigated? Okay, so if in fact someone has a service animal, they can take them anywhere in the community. They can't take them inside, they can't let them play in the pool, but they can be in the pool area, even if your pool rules don't allow dogs, because a service animal is a cane. Think of it as he's a medical equipment, it's a cane. He can go anywhere that the human can go. So can't stop them if it really is a service animal. And we're not going to dig into how do you tell that. That's not part of our topic today. So what is the protocol for a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor dispute over a tree overgrowing into a yard it wasn't planted in? So there's actually cases in Colorado Supreme Court about trees and how trees wander. And basically, the property line is the property line, and you can cut things um, that cross your property. That's trespass. So, okay. So we 
have the situation, nothing's in the declaration, right? There's nothing in the rules about what we're talking about. So should we just add a rule to deal with this? Um, and I want to caution you on taking that one up because yes, the board has authority to adopt rules on common property. Um, if you are a Kiowa community, right? Um, you have the ability to adopt rules because Kiowa gives you that ability to adopt rules on the property lots as well as on the common property. Um, you cannot ever add rules about use inside a unit. What's happening inside a unit can only be dealt with by a covenant amendment that can't be fixed by a rule. So assuming um, you're a Kiowa community, you could adopt rules about what's happening outside. You could adopt rules about how to use the common properties. Um, if you're not a Kiowa community, um, you've got to have authority in the declaration to add those rules, right? Um, so understand communities that might be a voluntary community um, can't just add rules without authority in their own declaration. But just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it, right? Um, you need to think through, one, is the rule something you're going to be able to enforce, right? Um, and do you really want to take on that job of enforcement? Because once you take it on, it's yours. And you, you, you put it in the rules, and um, if you now don't enforce it, now you've given somebody the ability to attack you because here's this rule and you're not enforcing it, right? So you want to make sure that when you think about, okay, we got a complaint, there's nothing in the deck, I have authority to adopt the rule, should I adopt one? Let me give you an example. I had a lot of owners recently, I'm sure many of you have had, dealt with this, complaining about jellyfish lighting, right? And I'll bet you most of your declarations don't discuss it, don't talk about it, it's not something that's even contemplated, right? So should you add rules about jellyfish lighting? Um, one, are you going to be out and about each night to determine who has it? Are you going to be out and about each night to determine how bright it is? Um, are you going to determine what colors are running? Um, you need to look about, you know, what your community, how it's designed. You know, if you're sitting on acreage, really? Do you really care that they got jellyfish lighting around their house? You know, they're acres away from each other. Uh, now, maybe if they're right on top of one another and, you know, they've got it turned up as bright as they can go, you know, it's glaring because they're only 10 feet from the neighbor's window and it's really offensive because it is a glaring light. And then in that circumstance, it might be appropriate to adopt that rule. But again, you want to look through one, never adopt a rule just for one individual, right? Really talk to your community as does your community want to do something on this? Um, and if your community wants to do something and it furthers communities and how the community looks and 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 everything you know works together, there's harmony in how things are going, then it might be appropriate to adopt the rule. But again, you don't adopt a rule because you got one homeowner who comes to all your board meetings and yells and screams about it because he doesn't like it. That's not the right reason to adopt a rule. How far does the right to peaceful enjoyment covenant go? Well, again, that's kind of in the eye of the beholder, right? You know, everybody's entitled to uh, the quiet enjoyment of your home. Um, but at the same time, when you walk into court, this is going to be considered at equity. And the court's going to go, hi, people are allowed to have kids outside playing in their yard. Kids can be loud. There's nothing illegal about that. So. You know, it's a subjective evaluation of what's happening and whether it's something that you would have a right to expect in your community, right? Um, at two in the morning, it's probably a right to expect, you know, pretty quiet. But, you know, at, at seven o'clock at night on a summer night, then, you know, people being loud outside and enjoying outside, you know, that's that's something that's allowed as well, okay? Um Got a bunch of questions here. Neighbor odors are a hot topic in the condo community right now, especially smoke because the windows are open um, and some of the units don't have AC. Again, uh, you know, depending on the situation, you have to think through, you know, is there a covenant there, right? Is there any covenant that prohibits barbecuing? Probably not. Any covenant that prohibits smoking? 
Maybe not. Again, you have to start with, is there a covenant that prohibits the conduct? Um, and if in fact there is no covenant that prohibits the conduct, then there's no action for you to take. And the home, homeowner who's complaining needs to go talk to their neighbor and say, hey, could you do this? Or could you work with me on this? This really bothers me. Um, again, they need to go meet their neighbors and they need to decide how to resolve their issues without dumping it on you because you're only there to enforce covenants. And if there's no rule, not your job. Uh, increase in general hostility and threats been really upsetting. Um, people blaming someone else uh, and swearing at you. Again, you know, you can't regulate people being rude. Um, uh, there's nothing that you're going to be able to do about that. Uh, you know, as far as people yelling and blaming you or, you know, one of the things that we're going to talk about is what you should respond and what you shouldn't respond. Um, but again, the hatefulness is just, uh, it's just escalating. So, okay. So there's no rule. Um, so what do you do? They've called you, they complained. Um, if in fact there's a city ordinance, say it's a loud party that's disturbing the peace, tell them to call the police. Um, again, it's not your job because there's no covenant. So again, you're going to have to refer them to someone else and say, I only have authority in the four corners of this declaration. If there's nothing there, I can't act. Okay. Um, and so, you know, it might be a circumstance where you're telling them, uh, you got to go talk to your neighbor about it. I can't help you. They're not going to like it. They're not. They want you to fix their problems. They want you to deal with everything. Um, they want you to know that, that they can, you know, basically dump it back on you and it's not yours. What you should never say is this is an owner to owner issue. Go talk to your neighbor, right? Because all that's going to do is tick them off and make them claim you're not doing your job, right? And so you want to be really clear about why you're not taking action. You really want to very clearly say, look, I don't have unlimited police powers. I don't have unlimited authority. I have the authority in the governing documents. That's it. If it's not there, I can't help you, right? So push it back on them. And if they're certain you have the ability to do it, say, great, point me in the direction. Tell me where in the documents it says that this is a violation. And I'll be happy to help you. But I can't find it. And I've looked. Um, because that way they can't say, well, you're not doing your job. Um, like, I am doing my job. There's nothing in the documents. So it's on you to either go talk to your neighbor or call the police or call somebody else. But I can't help you. And often... The issue is just rudeness. Come on, we, we've all done it. We've all seen it. We Time and time and time again, right? We have that homeowner who's hateful and he's nasty and he's rude and he cusses at you and he cusses at the, at the board members and he cusses at his neighbors. And that's just not your job, right? Okay, it's not your job to make him be nice. And so when you're neighbor A calls and says, neighbor B is just rude and he's cussing and he's calling me names. Say, I'm really sorry, but I can't help you with that. There's nothing in the covenants that prohibits rudeness. Okay. Um, from a manager's perspective, when you get that, um, nobody expects you to tolerate that either. Not in a court anyway. Um, I will tell you that as a general rule, just me personally, and I've always done this and I've had complaints and the judge just says, yeah, nobody has to tolerate that. Um, if somebody starts cussing, I stop them and say, if you don't stop cussing, I'm going to hang up the phone. And then I do if they continue. Um, same to you guys. If you're at a board meeting, ask them to stop. And if they don't, either adjourn the meeting, walk out, call the police, ask them to remove them. But it's not your job to tolerate the rudeness either. You know, if they want to be heard, Tell them they need to be civil and polite. That's why your conduct of meetings gives you all those rights to say, look, if you're not going to be civil and polite, we're going to ask you to leave. Because that's, you know, again, it's not your job to be the, you know, rudeness police. It's not your job to deal with homeowners who can't get it together, won't get it together. And it's not your job to get in the middle of two homeowners who are screaming at one another. That's not what covenants are about. 
if the CCNRs do not cover an issue or complaint, can, the, can Kiowa be the basis for authority? Well, Kiowa doesn't go into details like, um, don't yell at your neighbor, don't park here, right? That's not what Kiowa is about. Kiowa talks in general terms. So Kiowa is not going to give you authority um, to step over something. I mean, uh, again, you have to understand there are limits to your authority. Um, it, it, you have to accept that there are things that you can work through and things that you can't. What about backyard complaints in a single family association? That depends on the covenant. I mean, think about it. There are lots of covenants that say nowhere in the community can you have blah. So that covers backyards, that covers front yards, that covers everything. Now, the reality is that backyard complaints only get reported when the neighbors don't like one another. Because that tells you you should be nice to your neighbors. Um, if you get a complaint from a neighbor that they can see something in a backyard and the covenant say that item in the backyard is prohibited, then issue the covenant violation. Um, you know, there's some covenants say if it can be seen from the street, okay, then that's all the covenant says. You have to start every evaluation, no matter who gives you the complaint, with is there legal support in those covenants? Um, so that's where you start. Any chance of making HOA managers a protected class? I think you're, you're, you're SOL on that one. Um, does inside the unit include backyards? No, it does not. So there are many um, things that you can draft rules on about in the backyard, um, depending on your documents. Remember, when you're looking at covenants and you're looking at adding rules, the rule you want to add has to further the intent and the goals of the community. Um, but it can't be something that's absolutely silent in your covenants. What do I mean by that? So I've got some communities that nowhere in the covenants does it talk about parking. And all of a sudden the HOA says, let's draft a rule about parking. Well, my concern about doing that is that you're going to have a homeowner say, you're trying to rewrite the covenants. You're not clarifying anything in the covenants with this rule. You're just adding to the covenants without doing a covenant amendment. And so you could face serious challenge because you tried to adopt a rule on something that the covenants don't even touch upon. So rules, again, you are allowed to adopt rule, but if you can't connect the rule to something in your covenants, there's, there's a good likelihood it could be challenged as something you're trying to amend the covenants without by rule. Can you simply say jellyfish falls under nuisance as it goes against dark lighting principles? Okay, so dark lighting principles aren't a covenant. Dark lighting principles is something out on the internet. It's something out there that communities may have adopted or tried to jump into, but that's not a covenant. If your covenant doesn't speak to lighting, no glaring lights, no whatever, then you don't have a covenant against it, right? Again, jellyfish is an example of just kind of starting point of what do your covenants talk about? Do your covenants address it or not? And if they don't, do you need rules on it? Now, there are many communities that um, have adopted, uh, uh, you know, a darkness kind of provisions, resolutions, trying to keep their communities not having tons of lights at night. And that's fine. And if you've adopted that, then the jellyfish lighting might be a violation. Um, again, it's an issue of do you actually have a covenant there or it's just one neighbor trying to control everything in his next door neighbor's life with no covenant that really prohibits the actions of the neighbor. Even if they add a rule, is the person that has the lighting already grandfathered in? Well, that really depends because if in fact um, most of your communities, right, have a rule that says no exterior alteration without approval, right? So jellyfish is an alteration on the exterior. So I would say most times jellyfish lighting is going to fall into a category it needed to be pre-approved. So if it was pre-approved, um, then yes, Carolyn, it's going to be grandfathered because it was approved. But what if they didn't submit for it and then HOA decided it was too glaring and so they started taking action against them? Well, if again, their documents prohibited glare, 
then they're not going to have a grandfather. Now, if out of the blue, um, they decide, oh, we're hearing all these communities are having problems with this, we're going to adopt a rule, and they implement a rule not knowing there's jellyfish lighting already in their community, they just don't, haven't gotten any complaints, is the person with jellyfish lighting going to be grandfathered? No, not necessarily. Depends on how the rules word it. You could have the rule that says you may have this jellyfish lighting, but it can't be at a certain glare. It can't be affecting your neighbors. Um, again, it's going to depend on how they adopt it. Uh, and if it was never submitted and approved, there's always an argument that it was a violation anyway. Okay. I have a homeowner yelling at a neighbor because sprinkler water runs into the neighbor's driveway. Um, again, you're not there to control the water, probably. So not going to be your problem. Really, the neighbor to neighbor has to talk to each other and figure out how to, to work that out. Is there a reasonable expectation that neighbors should open and close doors quietly when they come in and out of a condo complex? No. Uh, what about boards who say everything's a nuisance? Well, I mean, here's the problem. Um, and let's look at this, right? All of our ability, when I say our, and I mean managers, uh, realistically, um, all of your ability to control nuisance pretty much got tossed out the window with 1137, right? Because you either have to give three days to stop the violation or 30 days to stop the violation. And how many of these incidents that are nuisance incidents extend more than three days, more than 30 days, right? It's a loud party, okay? It was over that night. Certainly didn't go on for three days. Certainly didn't go on for 30 days. Um, it's the doors closing really loudly. That's a nuisance. That's nice. It didn't go on to more than three days. It didn't continue more than 30 days. The reality is, is now with 1137, all of the nuisance type violations, you can send your courtesy notice, your warning notice, but you are never going to get to a fine, not on these nuisance type violations. You're just not going to get there. Um, you know, going back to our original list, you know, when we're talking, we start out with the first one was noise and loud parties, loud TVs, screaming, fighting, barking, uh, name calling. None of those are going to last more than, than three days, right? And, and none of those are even going to be a health safety issue, right? Loud party, loud TV, screaming, yelling, barking dogs. None of those are health or safety. It means that that conduct has to continue 30 days for you to get to a fine. So can you send a warning letter every time it happens? Sure, you can do that, but you're never gonna get past the warning letter because of 1137. So all of your nuisance type issues really are kind of out the door. Same with all the odor issues, right? Smoking, cooking. Now you might have the hoarder or the body odor person have something that lasts more than 30 days, right? How they're living, how they're you know uh, resolving things, um, that situation is going to be one that um, you're going to have last longer than 30 days. Um, if it's a hoarding situation in a condo or a townhome, I would argue, and I uh, have met with many uh, fire marshals who agree, that that is a safety issue because that creates safety of the person getting out of the home in case of, of danger, and it creates a much higher fire level uh, for the neighbors. So. If in fact you have a hoarder that's causing odors, that one you could probably get to a fine stage. That one you can get to a three day notice and that odor is still going to be there three days later and the odor is because of hoarding. And so that's a circumstance where you're going to have an ability probably to move that on um, and go beyond uh, your, your first notice. You're going to get to a fine stage. Okay. Um, what about trash? Nope, that's going to be, you know, rarely is that trash going to sit there for more than 30 days. It's not ever going to be a, a safety issue for trash. So that's a 30 day rule. So if you got trash issues, um, dog off leash, again, unless he's walking around for 30 days nonstop, uh, you're not going to get to a fine on the dog off leash. Now, not picking up his poop, you can probably get to that one on a 30 day. Uh, we've uh, unfortunately had some really rude neighbors who really didn't care and left it there long enough that we, we did on the odor issue get to the next stage. Um, parking is, is one of those where you're not going to have um, get past that first letter. Pool violations, uh, you're not going to get past that 
Um, and, and so those are things that, you know, we're probably going to have uh, an inability to, re to really deal with that. Um, one of the things that we have been recommending to uh, a lot of the communities is really look into your self-help uh, authority in your documents for pool violations. Uh, if in fact your documents give you the ability that based upon a pool violation you can remove their access to the pool, uh, create those kind of rules and use that so that you can take action. You're never going to have to worry about getting to fine stage because you're going to use your self-help authority and avoid the 1137 problems that you've got. Um, so um, homeowners prefer to avoid confrontation and choose to make the manager deal with it. Yep, they do. Um, and a lot of times you're going to tell them it's just, you know, not your problem. Can we kick them off Zoom uh, in a meeting if they're rude? Yes, you can. Um, if, in fact, you warn them first, um, remind them of the conduct of meetings policy and say, look, whoa, you need to stop. Conduct of meeting policy is very clear. There'll be no attacks, no, you know, cussing, no swearing. And if you continue to do this, we are going to remove you from the meeting. Um, so, yeah, absolutely, you can do it. Just warn them first and remind them that your conduct of meetings policy says that that's not allowed. Um, question about backyards that can't be seen during inspection. Next door neighbor sends pictures, um, not in compliance. They don't want friction and won't allow you to use the picture. How do you proceed? Okay, so one, once they sent you the picture, you have the picture. If I send you something, I don't get to tell you, you can't use this. I just gave it to you. It, it's now yours. They don't get to control your use of it. They gave it to you. You can send out your notice because you have the photo. Um, your, uh, the Nonprofit Act as well as Kiowa talks about if in fact there's a complaint and um, those documents are inside the file, as a homeowner, I can come get a copy of my file. So I'm gonna get to see who made the complaint against me. So neighbors who think they get to stay an anonymous, it just isn't gonna happen, okay? Uh, see. Oh, what is jellyfish lighting? Jellyfish lighting is that colored lighting that can change colors and you, you control it with your phone and, and so it can be really loud and obnoxious. Um, our covenants require earth tone colors for exterior, very broad. Do the rules need to specify every color in earth tone? Well, I will tell you that um, that argument came up in court uh, one time on a case of mine and they said bright blue is the color of the sky, therefore that's an earth tone. So if you uh, want to control the colors in your community, then you need to specify what colors you mean. Neighbor had a large party and a porta potty on site uh, gone after the weekend. <laughs> well, again, obviously it didn't continue for more than 30 days. So, you know, that's the end of it. So, okay. So, as I kind of was walking through, most of your nuisance violence, you're never going to get to fine stage. They're never going to continue unabated for 30 days. So work with your attorneys on self-help. Um, look, police have all kinds of disturbing the peace. Um, there's all kinds of city codes on noise violations. So if you've got noise issues, a lot of times the right answer is to tell the homeowner complaining, call the police. Because that's who can take action right then. Barking dog, call animal control. I mean, use those police officers because that's the only ability you have to try and stop what's happening, right? Um, I know the neighbors aren't gonna wanna talk to one another, but they need to. Because again, if it's not a covenant violation, you can't help, okay? So what other things are we seeing that are kind of some of these neighbor to neighbor type issues that are kind of problems and what are you supposed to be doing about it? Um, a lot of the complaints we have right now are about parking right? Because you guys can no longer stop parking in the street, right? So those complaints that come in, you need to explain to the homeowners complaining, guys, the covenants were trumped by the statute. I can't do anything on a city street. Now, if it's a private street, you still can, but now you just have to comply with the towing restrictions, right? Um, and essentially that's going to boil down to there's got to be three violations and then there has to be a specific um, you know, document 
that shows that the board voted to tell somebody to tow the car, right? So you gotta jump through all the hoops, but you can tow if it's on private property. Um, but otherwise you're gonna have to tell your homeowners, call the police, you're gonna have to enforce their abandoned car violations um, because you no longer can enforce your covenant restrictions. What about, you know, things happening inside the unit? We talked about a little bit, you can't write a rule about it, but what about businesses inside a unit that's causing owners to complain that there's all this traffic coming and going and coming and going, right? Um, the new bill that came out um, and allows businesses inside a unit allowed HOAs to create rules that kind of put a um, limit the nuisance that the business would cause on its neighbors. So, you know, if there's an external component, you can draft rules to stop that and still stop the business inside a unit so that it isn't a nuisance to the neighbors. Um, if you don't have rules about that kind of thing, you may want to talk to your attorney to draft those because the new law said, yeah, they can have a home-based business, but the HOA can create rules to make sure there's no nuisance created by that home-based business. So that's one of those things that you want to look at. Again, even when you draft those rules, guys, remember um, that the external component that's bothering the neighbor has to continue 30 days, right? Um, or if it doesn't continue 30 days unabated, it's, you're still not going to be able to get that letter out the door, right? So we still are going to be very limited in what we can address when it's a nuisance. What about when the homeowners are saying, oh no, there's crimes occurring, right? Uh, I can't tell you the number of times I've seen my manager tell me, hey, um, <laughs> neighbors are selling drugs. Um, tell them to call the cops. You need to remember that the cops don't want to hear you, the manager, tell them what the neighbor told you. The cop needs to talk to the eyewitness, okay? They need to know what is being seen, why they think it's a drug deal, why they think there's crimes occurring, why do they think, you know, this is happening, okay? Um, you can't be that intermediary. So when you get that neighbor who says, you need to stop them, they're selling drugs. You need to tell that person, they have to tell the police that. You can't tell them for them, they have to call the police. What about the, the, the complaint? Well, the police are always being called out to, the, to that house. Well, generally it's not a crime simply to have the police called on your unit, right? Could be that there's a medical emergency could be that there's domestic violence. Um, it could be um, any number of things that cause the police to come to that house. Could be a warrant. But unless the crime occurred in the community, the fact that the police got called to issue the warrant doesn't make that a covenant violation, okay? So when you get that call of the cops are there constantly, you gotta get rid of them. Well, they could be an owner. I can't get rid of an owner. I don't really care how many times the cops are called. It's still his house and he still gets to live there, even though the police are called a lot. So, you know, just because the police are called doesn't mean that, you know, it's something you can deal with. What about, oh my God, it's a sex offender moving in. Um, it's not illegal to buy a house, even if you're a sex offender. It's not illegal to be a tenant and be a sex offender. Um, should you tell anyone? No, you should not. Very, very emphatically, no. Um, there was a community in Florida that thought they were going to help out their community by letting them know that a sex offender was moving in. Unfortunately, the name was a very common name and they mislabeled the guy and they ended up instead paying out several hundred thousand dollars for libeling the person who moved into that house. If you're very concerned and you have homeowners who are absolutely concerned and they want to do something, you can put a link on your website that takes them out of your website to the sheriff's website and they can look it up themselves. Don't provide the information. If you start providing the information, what happens when you miss one? Because when you miss one and that person hurts somebody, they're gonna sue you because they relied upon you to do the research, find it out and tell them. Don't take on a job that is not yours. It's not yours to do and so you shouldn't take it on and there is a huge amount of risk if you try and take it on. Okay. 
what about um, I have one who keeps trying to change rules and regs for habitual offenders. Um, yeah, once it's over, you have to start over. That's what the law requires. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, if you have a homeowner who or a board member who wants to pick up where they left off, you can't. Um, you have very specific requirements now. Since 1137 was passed, you're, you're stuck. You have to start over once they cure it. That's what the law says. Um, question of how long has the lighting been there? So anybody who makes a modification um, to the property and you don't catch it within a year, you are correct that one year is the statute of limitations. If you don't get it, find it within one year and take a lawsuit in court within that one year, it's gone. Statute of limitations. And I don't understand what you mean by pest control. In our community, a hoarder's outdoor storage of food items led to rodent infestation. Um, yes, I would agree that that is a health issue, whether it's inside or outside when they start hoarding. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to read all these questions. You guys are, are, are throwing lots at me. They send a photo, send the notice. What happens in 30 days when you need another notice for a fine? Um, email back to the neighbor who complained and ask them, is it fixed? Um, that's all you can do. Where is the conduct of behaviors? Um, look in your conduct of meetings. Conduct of meetings policy, it's one of your nine required policies, will, if, if you had us draft them, they're going to have provisions in there, no cussing, no swearing, must be civil, must be you know polite, professional, all of that's in the conduct of meetings policy. Um, if colors are not specified in the guidelines, does the committee have a right to reject based on not fitting in with the community? Absolutely. There is clear case law that talks about that, you know, uh, there's some old cases that went to the Colorado Supreme Court that talk about on uh, architectural approval that it's okay that that discretion is left with a committee so that that committee can kind of control the community and, 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 you know, things change and colors change and colors get popular and colors are not popular. And so colors are going to change depending on a committee. That's fine. Um, you don't have to have a palette. You know, uh, here's a, the list of colors we'll allow. It can say everything has to be pre-approved, painted on the garage and we'll drive by. And if we like it, great. If not, we deny it. I mean, there's all kinds of things you have. You can do with that as long as you have a specific process and you follow the same process for everybody. Um, you can get creative on how you do colors um, as far as approving and disapproving them, but there has to be a consistent process. Um, what happens between a complaint because one neighbor says his neighbor's dog damaged his fence? Okay, that's going to be one where you look to your covenants and go, one neighbor damaging another neighbor's property is not mine to enforce. So Mr. Neighbor, that's not a covenant violation. You'll need to go talk to your neighbor about damage uh, to your property. Again, look to your covenants, start there, and then go back to your neighbor and say, that's not a covenant violation. That's not mine um, to, to fix. Um, we have a performing art center across the street from our parking lot. Can we tow center patrons who park in our lots without three warnings? No, you cannot. The statute is very specific. The statute talks about the immediate tows and they're very limited. And so you, you have to follow the process and the process for immediate tows is in a fire lane and or blocking a driveway. Um, it's sat there without moving in a spot it's not allowed to be in for over 24 hours. Um, so none of the, those are gonna fit, uh, none of the options for immediate tows are gonna fit for your performing arts center. Can we do a webinar around towing? I don't know, but I can certainly put that up to somebody. I don't control those, but I can certainly throw it out there and say, here's one that's been requested. Um, Claims about over occupancy. Um, don't touch it. Not with a 10 foot pole. Why? 
because what always happens on occupancy levels is the person that gets the violation notice is going to make an immediate claim that it's familial discrimination. And really it's inside the community or inside the unit. You don't care. What you care about is parking, right? Control your parking through the abilities of rules, regulations, uh, permits, whatever. Deal with parking. Don't deal with whoever's living in the house. That will always get you in trouble and it will always make them attack you um, and, and, and make a claim of familial discrimination. Okay, so owners harassing a neighbor. First, the word harass, I think if all of us sat down, we would all have a different idea of, you know, what is harassment, right? What do we think harassment entails? And so because all of us have a different concept of harassment, that becomes a very difficult question to begin with. But for the most part, your covenants don't talk about harassment, okay? Harassment is a crime. It's defined. I, I, I threw in there what the definition of harassment is. And so if one of your homeowners calls you and says, my neighbor is harassing me, tell them to call the cops. It's a crime to harass. You know, here's, here's the statute. Tell them to call the cops, tell them to deal with the, with the crime uh, in that respect, because it's not yours. That's not a covenant issue, okay? And, and again, it's not your job to try and stop them from dealing with their, their neighbor, right? Well, what about if the owner is harassing you, the manager, or a board member? So if I have to go into court and prove harassment, I can tell you it's going to be at least you better be coming to me because they're emailing you more than once a day. I mean, there, there's going to need to be two or three a day emails before it's going to be harassment. Okay. Owners have a right to contact the board about whatever's happening in the community. So the board members, you know, for the most part, when they decided they wanted to be a volunteer and, and sign on for the board, um, they, ex they kind of opted into this. Now, can we help and control it somewhat, even if it doesn't rise to the level that a court would consider it harassment? Yes. You have to allow homeowners to contact you in a condo, in a townhome, um, you know, for emergency like water leaks and, and stuff like that. You have to allow them some sort of access to get in touch with you for that emergency. But for anything other than emergency, there's no requirement that you allow them to email you, right? So if you have that homeowner who is abusing the privilege, who is abusing their rights and, and taking over all, all of your time, all the manager's time or of board's time, you can tell them, stop. I'm not going to accept your emails anymore. You're burying me in emails. You are one person out of the thousands that I have to deal with and you are taking up 80% of my time. Okay, I can't do that. So you can tell them that you will only let them send snail mail and that if they send you emails anyway, you're not even going to look at them. You're going to throw them in a folder and once a month, once a month, you will look at them and send them an answer. Um, I would never, ever recommend giving out your cell phone number because they'll bury you in text. And if you're accepting text, um, you really need a way to um, kind of, uh, print them out so that you can show the cops that you're being harassed. Okay. Um, but definitely tell them, I'm not going to accept this. You don't have to accept it. Um, you don't have to accept their calls. Tell them emergency number for emergency, anything else, send it snail mail. Um, threats of harm. Again, if there's a real threat of harm, call the cops. Um, if your neighbor says, or if, if one neighbor says the other neighbor is threatening, tell them to call the cops. Okay. Um, a lot of times the threat is I'm going to have you fired. I'm going to make sure you lose your job. I'm going to get rid of the board. I'm going to overturn the covenants. Those kinds of threats aren't threat of harm. And those aren't going to get a reaction there. It's not a covenant issue. It's not a, any kind of issue that any cop is going to care about, right? If it's a threat of harm, you can get a civil protection order, but it has to be threat of imminent harm. Okay. Remember, if you need a civil protection order, they're very simple to get. It is a form. 
Why? Because the courts wanted to make it simple for victims of domestic violence to get that form, right? And so if you need it, it's really easy to get. We can get you the forms. You can hire us. We can help you get it. However, if in fact you hire us, you cannot put the cost of the attorney's fees on the homeowner who is threatening the board's ledger. Why? Because attorney's fees are for covenant enforcement and stopping somebody from threatening you is not enforcing covenants. Okay, so understand that we can help you, we can direct you, um, but again, it's not something that you can turn over to attorney's fees onto that homeowner's ledger. Um, don't take on a duty where nothing exists, right? You guys are not uh, parents, you're not caretakers, you're not counselors. When you have that one homeowner who wants you to step in the middle and try and stop the fighting, not your job right? You are not there um, for the homeowner who is getting elderly and has dementia. And, and it's not your job to make sure that she's okay. If you can find family, notify the family, but it's not your job to take on caretaking and checking on her. And if you have a board member who starts doing that, understand that once you take on a duty, you better do it well because you can be sued for stopping it then. So be very, very careful. Don't use the word safety and security when you're drafting newsletters, articles, when you're doing anything, because your job as a covenant enforcement, your job in enforcing covenants in any respect is not about security. That's the cops, right? Don't take on a job that is not yours. Um, be careful for tricks by the homeowners who are burying you in emails, right? When they're doing that and you're telling them, stop burying me in emails, they may submit something like a plan, an ARC form, and it's buried in the in their email that had 14 attachments and you didn't see it, and now you miss the deadline and it's automatically approved. If in fact you've got somebody who's burying you in emails, tell them you're not gonna take the emails. Tell them you're, you're stopping the emails. Be very clear that they can't submit ARC forms if they're burying you in emails, right? If they're making complaints about another homeowner, tell them not to bury that in the middle of an email where you're gonna miss it. Be responsive to these people and stop it if you can, because again, they're going to use it to try and show that you're not doing your job. Um, texting, guys, we all try and have life. Um, I don't recommend that you take texts from anybody um, because, you know, one, it's very difficult as a um, proof later on. Um, and two, it's so easy for people to abuse your time when they, you give them that ability to text you. Emails are bad enough. I mean, we all are attached to our phones night and day. Um, they don't need to get to text you as well. I don't recommend it. Nothing legal, nothing uh, good, bad, or different, but I don't recommend you let them do it um, because it'll bite you later on. Limit the access. Guys, we do HOA law. If it's an emergency, as I said in the beginning, that's a 911 call. That's not us. Um, remember that other than water leaks, um, you really aren't the person to call if it's an emergency. Our focus is the land, covenants. It's about touching and concerning the land. Um, you know, it, you have enough on your on your plate without all of the homeowners who are going to try and take over your life and tell you that you're responsible to fix everything. Um, it, it, it's again, if it's not in the covenants, it's not yours to fix. And if it's an emergency, it's probably not in the covenants and it's not yours to fix. Um, really has to be some control and help yourself. Um, I'm going to go through some of these questions because I got a whole slew of them that I haven't answered yet. So I'll try and get through those. Um, I've already exceeded the time. I'm going to continue to try and get through these questions. Um, but um, uh, I don't, I want to be respectful if you guys all have to go. So, um, someone, um, oh, so what happens when there's hoarding and it causes, uh, uh, building pests. That's what the best pest control is about. Got it. Okay. Yeah. When you have um, someone who's hoarding, um, it's often a situation that it causes all kinds of rodents and pests and all kinds of things. And the problem is, is how do you gain access to the condo? And again, there's no automatic right to gain access to the condo to verify they are toting, to, to, to verify they are hoarding. Um, we often find out they're hoarding because of a water leak or a smell. Um, and so oftentimes, you know, we send them those letters because of that um, and or someone sees inside when they walk in the unit and, and can report that to you. And that's how you find out. Um, 
uh, I have a second vote for towing webinar. I'll, I'll, again, I'll pass it on. Does the fire lane have to be marked by the fire department or can the HOA just put up fire lane signs? So my recommendation anytime you think it's a fire lane is to have a fire marshal confirm that for you. I have had many, many managers and board members tell me that they believe something was a fire lane. And when I asked the fire marshal, they said, no, it wasn't. And since the statute gives you that immediate towing right only if it's a fire um, lane, I would make sure and verify that. It's not something HOA just gets to call it that and therefore tow. What do you do about a board member who is harassing a neighbor? Um, again, harassment is generally not going to be something that is a covenant. So again, if you have a complaint that one, um, say neighbor A is a board member, neighbor B is complaining that neighbor A is harassing them, you're gonna tell the person who thinks they're being harassed to call the police. The fact that you're going to tell them to call the police on your client um, is something you may have to have some internal damage control about. But again, it's not a covenant issue, so it's not yours to fix. If we're concerned about an owner's safety, a excessive drinking, can we reach out to a family member? No. Um, again, um, if you have a, a homeowner who thinks that um, their neighbor's drinking too much, I, I, talk about kind of overstepping that's not your job um don't take on jobs that are not your job um uh oh thank you um sorry to read a list of questions and somebody thanking me so thank you um another vote for towing and another uh how to deal with complaints about construction noise again i just I don't think construction noise is ever going to be something that's yours, right? How are you going to get there? It's not going to continue unabated nonstop for, for 30 days. So I don't think there's much you're ever going to, to, to deal with. Um, so I, I think for the most part, what you want to look at on all these again is start with your covenants. If it's not in the covenants, look in your rules. If it's not in the rules, thank the person who complained to you and tell them that you don't have any authority to handle it. Uh, I've gotten through all the questions. Um, I will post an, and I will let Alina, who is in charge of our classes, know that there were multiple requests for towing webinars. Um, I will tell you that David Claussen did a fabulous step-by-step -step article, and it's on our website, on towing. So if you go on our website and type towing, you're going to get some great instructions because he really did a fabulous article on it. Um, so I would go look there first, but I will pass along your comments about telling. So thank you very much. And, um,